Oh, it'll go great. You know, it's kind of care. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, yeah. Anytime we have conversations, I know like so many things come from it. It's just, I realized like maybe in the past month, the way that I talk and think mm -hmm. is like, um, it's like a mad lib right like I don't know anything but the word that I'm saying in the present uh -huh. and like maybe it reaches the end of the sentence <laughs> or by the time I get to the end it's like the beginning is just like forgotten and out of view so I do that all the time I was like did I actually say the point that I was trying to make oh no thanks that, that turned out different <laughs> just stepping stones <laughs> What are we talking about again? <laughs> I forgot. Hello, everyone. I don't know if they can see us yet. I don't know if they can either. I can't see them. I think it's pro so we won't see anybody. <gasps> no. um, mm -mm. So everybody comes in as like a, a um, as like a viewer for the for the I forget what it's called when it's this kind of thing. I, Discord has a feature like that too, but basically everyone is muted and you don't see any cameras, but mm -hmm. they can interact with the chat and they can do like polls and questions. Um, yeah, but it's slightly different from like a full Zoom meeting where you can ah. see everybody. It would be kind of cool to be able to see like a hundred people, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I would get so easily distracted though. <laughs> I think that was the point is like um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> leave it up for like the mass the chaos of being like everyone can do whatever they want you know it's, yeah this will definitely keep it much like our previous discussion so that'll be awesome <laughs> <laughs> i forget how hi, to Jojo. Back. hi daniel this is, this is i don't know if they can see us but i'm very enthusiastic so if you guys can see hello <laughs> And if you can't, we'll see you in a moment. All right. <laughs> about you, Daniel. They can't see us. <gasps> they can. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> we're just we're talking about a lot of uh, things beforehand, so we're all warmed up and <laughs> very chatty already. <laughs> <laughs> So I know we're waiting um, and they're trickling and I think in the chat, I don't know if anybody has had a chance to look through the chat at the top um, and really kind of while we're waiting for everybody to come in, we wanted in that chat for uh, to hear from you and hear um, what is your why and uh, what is uh, driving and or feeding your spirit because uh, this is kind of going to be some of what we're talking about today. And we're so excited to be able to share this. We've been having this, these questions back and forth, talking, um, delving into the question. And um, it's been just fascinating talking to um, our wonderful panelists. Uh, I'm going to start by enjoying, uh, introducing myself for those of you that don't know me um, and what I do. And then um, I'm going to have... Daisy and Richard introduce themselves, and then we're going to kind of go through um, what we've been talking about on the importance of your why, how the why, your why actually um, delves, changes the way that you spend your every day, um, how you can kind of pull and uh, lean into that in both your personal and your professional art and or work and um, for some of you it is both. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll begin by saying uh, I'm Zara Bates. I'm the global educator for Cavassier Cognac, which is probably why you're seeing a lot of Cavassier here. Uh, I was a uh, cap uh, in this all cap session uh, from 2013, uh, 2014 and 2015. Um, and I also am the co-founder of a wonderful organization called Art Beyond the Glass which uh, Daisy has been part of and Rich has been part of and one of our uh, people in our chat, Daniel Jang, um, he is the other co-founder. And this is something that really was, a, you know, just a, a, a bit of a love story for our community and being able to kind of reach into what we valued as a community and create something together. Um, so that's why it is so important to me. And I would love to um, have, Daisy introduce herself and her artist journey and her history in hospitality. Sure. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Daisy, and I am a freelance illustrator. Uh, I didn't start out that way. I actually kind of started out that way. I dropped out of school, took a bunch of jobs. I was a teacher and then became a bartender, and I fell in love with it, um, really fed into like my people pleasing. So I started as a server, became, you know, the bartender, then the head bartender at a bar called Tooker Alley. And then, uh, yeah, I tried to stay in the industry. Eventually that didn't really pan out when I moved. And so I kind of became an illustrator out of spite, but it worked out really well. Like I, I love my job. I love what I get to do. Um, and I really, get a lot of enjoyment now out of empowering artists, fellow artists, especially people in the service industry. Oh, and I also capped in 2015, I want to say. That sounds right, 2015. <laughs> and Rich, would you like to introduce yourself, your artist journey, and your history in hospitality? Of course. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Richard. Um, so I'm originally from Anchorage, Alaska, and I moved to Chicago roughly about six years ago. I was also a CAP um, from 2016 to 2018. Maybe it was 2017, 2019. I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my journey through hospitality is very similar. I um, I went to just wanted to go to school for music originally, and I had a lot of other projects and career paths that I thought I was going to, as many of us do when we're at that age. And so I became a busser at TGI Fridays, um, worked my way up to kind of pay through school, became a bartender and then a night bartender, moved to a local restaurant in Anchorage that was trying to like push the envelope called Ginger. Um, and then on my way to Chicago, I've, uh, I've prim primarily worked at Bad Hunter, which is uh, had closed during the pandemic and currently um, the head bartender at Monteverde, which is in a lovely Italian restaurant in the West Loop. Um, and yeah, my artistry now, and since it's been for maybe the last you know few years, has been photography and videography. I definitely developed a little more of it during the pandemic, and really studied the art of it, and took more uh, the craftsmanship of it, and and just love looking through a lens. So can't wait to talk about more about how we found our why. Fantastic. Well, that is a great lead-in. Thank you, Rich. Um, so. Part of this is um, I'm super passionate about personal development, and I think at the core of personal development is really knowing um, what it is that you are passionate about and what gets you out of bed in the morning. So um, let's start off with uh, Rich, since we started with Daisy last time. What is your why? What gets you out of bed in the morning, even on those days when you want to stay under the covers? Yeah, and you may be able to see it through my Zoom, but my little old dog that's right there is one reason why I like to get out of bed in the morning. But uh, there's a few things. You know, I think that um, uh, hospitality really do truly gets me out of bed. And I do thoroughly enjoy where I work in the hospitality industry. I know that during the pandemic, we, and even before that, that we have kind of analyzed maybe some holes and problems within our industry. Um, and, and some have found different alternatives and maybe ways in which they can work and kind of push those um, troublesome issues. Um, I do truly still love going to work and being in front of people and serving guests. It's something I do truly enjoy. Um, I think another reason why I, in, in connection with my photography and videography, it's, it's a platform that I think that when we were, we're all really busy, it's something that I make time for myself that I know that I want to do and something I thoroughly enjoy doing. And um, it's, you know, I think right now is a great time in which that's so important that, you know, now we're all getting maybe a little busier or even in general finding what is more important to us and figure out our priorities alongside just trying to navigate through this, you know, crazy world at the moment that, that hour, 30 minutes, whatever time it is of making time for whatever act you want to do is very important. So um, it's so calming to just kind of clock out, I guess you would say, of the rest of the world and and be able to, for me, to just like take photos and, and just, you know, even videos and just kind of look through that more of an artistic perspective rather than it being more of a job than anything else. Um. And uh, <laughs> I'll be honest, I often work from bed, so it doesn't always get me out of bed in the morning. But 
uh, and that's a terrible habit. Don't do it, guys. But um, I think that really connecting with nature is something that gets me out of my house. Food really motivates me and gets me out of bed in the morning um, because I love to eat. Uh, and a lot of the time it's responsibility. It's like the things that I have to do. Sometimes it's anxiety being driven by those responsibilities. And sometimes it's like the sheer force of like, this is what I have to do today. This is the stuff that's important to me and it needs to get done because other people are relying on it. That is um, a fascinating uh, answers uh, uh, for what gets you out of the bed, but I don't know if what your why was answered. Yeah, so my why is, sorry, sometimes I answer things very literally. My <laughs> why is uh, a pretty simple one. It's uh, what makes me feel satisfied, mm -hmm. um, which is sometimes a hard thing to find an answer to, uh, but it's been, you know, a personal journey of mine to really find the balance between the high anxiety sort of overperforming all or nothing person that mm -hmm. I am inclined towards being um, and then finding where I can actually fall on that spectrum where I'm actually happy because, uh, you know, happy is a very unfortunately abstract and complicated thing that Often when we try to measure our happiness, we end up being more unhappy, but that's why I try to lean more towards the language of satisfaction, where it's more about like, where do I feel like I have fulfilled that purpose, that goal of, you know, wanting to complete a task that mm -hmm. makes me feel fuller. Um, so that's, that's a big reason for my why. And uh, I think I talked about empowering other people. It's, yeah. it's important to me to uh, engage with my community. Um, and to delve in a little bit further, how did you find your why? Like, what were the steps that you took? And because a lot of people say like, well, I don't know that I have anything to say in this way, or I don't know if um, my voice is valid in this conversation. How did your, you find your why? And how did understanding those aspects of yourself um, kind of change your day-to-day -day approach? Yeah, it's something I talk to a lot of uh, artists about, especially younger artists. I teach still um, sometimes, and that is a question that I face um, very frequently. And I talk about my own journey, which was very nonlinear. Uh, you know, it was <laughs> a lot of moving to different places, to different cities. It was taking different kinds of jobs. Um, and ultimately it was driven by wanting to make people happy, like being able to have a skill of something that, you know, it could, it could make somebody smile. It could make them feel like their own job was a little bit better, right? Because they're represented with a uh, design that they really like. Um, but coming to that was really hard. I mean, I'll be honest, like, I still sometimes face a lot of anxiety around it, but um, part of it was having really great clients. Part of it was having incredible mentors and educators. Um, and it was sort of shifting my needs of being survival motivated and being sort of um, stress or like fighting against somebody else's force to really being more self-directed and um, caring a lot more about what I feel satisfied by and what I feel fulfilled by. Um, and a lot of that, again, has to do with nature and just getting to work from home and, and draw and you know do things that I really enjoy. Thank you. Um, Rich, I would like to pose that same question to you uh, about um, how did you discover your why and um, how does that affect your everyday approach? your day-to-day -day approach? Of course. Um, I think, you know, in, in vain of even what Daisy was talking about, I think there's this ideology of fulfillment. And I think there also, this is this huge pressure that you need to be great and succeed in, in, in various parts. And I think that that idea is still important, but I do think that a lot of trial and error and obstacles lead on that way. I know that sounds a little cliche, but it's a couple of things for me personally. I, you know, I tried a lot of things and then when they became a job, I was like, 
I absolutely don't want to do this anymore. It like took the love out of it. You know, it was like, uh, you know, I aspire musician. Then when it was like, oh, I'd get paid to do something. And I was like, uh, I don't really know. I don't want to be paid for music. I know that sounds weird, but I, I just wanted to play. And then um, I thought I maybe would want to become a dancer in college. And so I did that to dance for a company for a little bit. And then again, it became more of a job. And then I kind of lost a little bit of love for it. And then I think you know, it's one of those things that what stuck around was hospitality. It was like something that I knew that I was like, okay, I'll, I can keep doing this. And, I, and even to this day, like I do truly still love it. Um, I think that in that journey of, of finding that and like figuring out how I became a photographer, videographer, and again, it is a job is it, it put passions that I loved, which, you know, like art in general, you know, music and dance, but same thing that I can still enjoy those and put some sort of perspective there into something that I do here. And, you know, a lot of my photography videography is hospitality oriented, whether it's food and beverage or event clientele or whatnot. And, and so those coincide with each other, which is again, a great platform for me to continue to love for both and it keeping it kind of at bay. Um, but, you know, it, it, I think it just takes a lot of not, I don't want to say struggle per se, but it does take a lot of will and kind of being able to like bounce back if something doesn't work out to the next one. And that goes for more than just the art. It goes more for each job. It goes for more than each project per se. You know, you're not going to do every project, you know, 150%. But uh, I think that if you maybe take a little bit of the pressure off yourself, and then to knowing that you're doing this to figure out if it's going to be something that can complete that fulfillment that we talked about in the beginning um, to some degree, at least a degree enough where you can, you're happy with that and content with that. Then I think that it's a, a great um, segue into becoming your why or, you know, remaining your why. So great. Um, we do have a poll out there. I don't know if you've seen it um, at the poll being, what did you spend your most time doing as a kid? Were you making things? Were you um, playing with things? Or were you taking things apart? Um, it's a great way to kind of assess um, finding different things that you were passionate about when you were younger and kind of start on that path to finding your why. I, this is something that I usually ask anybody who asks me for guidance to start thinking about that before we have conversation. Um, while you all are talking or doing your polls, I just wanted to read from the chat. Um, a couple of people just shared with us instead of with the um, the whole group um, what they uh, what they are passionate about. And Federico said that cocktail history is what feeds my spirit. I love to get people to know the rich history that lies behind every glass. I'm currently investigating the history of the mixology in South America, mainly Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil, and its connections to Italy, France, and North American mixology. Well, that is fascinating. That's so cool. I would love to hear a panel discussion about that. <laughs> so you should pitch that, Federico. Uh, and then Joanne says that uh, I think for me what drives is creative interaction, building beautiful things, be that building up those in my downline, building delicious liquid libations, and most recent, my most recent drive, building up businesses and helping their bottom line while still feeding my creative passion. Amazing, I love I that. Feel that. Thank you for that heads up, Alex. So um, now that we've kind of like looked at what your why is, Let's start talking about what you do every day to kind of um, keep it in focus and keep yourself inspired because I know the why can be transitional. It can have ups and downs and highs and lows. Um, I would say, um, oh, the full popped up. Um, equally between making things and playing with things, less so taking things apart. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Um, so let's start with you, Rich. Um, uh, what do you do every day to keep your why in focus? Um, and how do you keep yourself inspired? Because I know that the why can, um, uh, whether it be like really clearly defined and strong, your life may change around you. And that why may not be the thing that you are as um, passionate about, um, much like what has been happening throughout the whole globe for the past two years. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, exactly what you're saying. I think the one thing I would say is, you know, prioritizing and how do you get there? And so I think sometimes you don't know what your priority is because, you know, a pandemic happens and you kind of were like figuring out, like, I, I don't know anything at the moment and that's okay. I think that how I kind of keep up with that, and we can kind of talk about this further down the road too, is I'm, I, I try to keep myself organized in that structure of priority. So whether it's writing the same list I probably wrote 20 times today, or, or figuring out maybe something that's more in focus of priority, I just, I just figure out priority. And I think priority for me personally, um, I know this sounds a little cliche, but it's others happiness. And it's like my partner, my, my friends and my, you know, my cohorts and my, you know, everyone, even at work, you know, it's like their, whether it's a completion of action or their actual, just like genuine happiness is enough to drive me and even further, you know? And I think that a big reason why I stay creative is, is that is just that, you know, I, I guest interaction and I've primarily only worked at restaurant bars and I think prop because you know you get the time to have conversations and you get to discuss and and not that you can't have that at cocktail bars but sometimes they're just four deep and you don't get that time that's also okay but um I, you know that again driving that continuing that creativity is just talking with people getting to meet people and and you know people who are traveling meeting other artists and that just leads to conversations meeting old friends that you haven't seen in you know roughly two years who come back and like you know I haven't seen you in a while how are things and uh, meeting new friends and then you know this job that I took on recently has been a new job so there's just no new whole group of people that I've got to meet and yeah. um, have just you know have helped also bring the like fuel the fire of my um, artistry and my you know photography and videography the restaurant you know Monteverde themselves have always been like whatever you'd like to do in this restaurant we would definitely are going to support you and continue that drive that you have you know there's you know, we've gotten to do some photographies for, for magazines local in Chicago and maybe some bigger ones down the road and you know that's, that's all I ask for is to continue to doing that because it you know brings me that um, and then I, I really think that uh, keeping up with it I guess so just making sure that it stays in that priority of focus is just making sure that the other platforms in my life and although you can't control them as you mentioned before um, stay uh, not consistent because if that you can't you can't make everything consistent but um understanding that it, it you know just the, i guess comprehensively understanding it all making sure that it's just things are going to vary in, in this platform whether it's money or you know whatnot and that's something that i definitely do want to talk about later and, and maybe even right now is that like what drives us to do our art sometimes or what drives us to be to that level of fulfillment is finances financial success and and we live in a capitalistic society and we can get on a tangent about the conversations of that. But at the moment, this is, I mean, we do the things to hopefully find a little bit of joy, not a little bit, but a lot of joy and fulfillment, but also to make sure it's worth it. I mean, you got to understand that, especially with the pandemic that we, majority of us lost our jobs or were furloughed and whatnot. And it, it was like, how, how can we make sure that whatever we're doing keeps, keeps us, at bay or keeps us onto the next thing and um and also knowing your worth and i know that we'll get into that a little bit later but uh, yeah i mean I, that's could not be the one of the most important things and i think that goes in hand in hand with priority is is financial success and making sure that it, it's not selling your soul i guess you would say that you can still keep um within the ethics that you love and you prep, take pride in but that also maybe fall in line to some sort of again uh, financial stability to to continue to grow with it. Sorry, I took a lot of time, Daisy. This is now yours. Time. No, I loved every single thing you were saying. I really, I had like a bunch of questions too that I wanted to follow up on, but uh, let me reformat my my thoughts for a second. So on priorities, I think that that is something that I realized uh, as a bartender. I was great at the connecting with people, even though I have a lot of social anxiety, I really prioritize human connections. So when I'm having a conversation, I really like to be very present 
Unfortunately, that meant that sometimes my service would be a little bit slow. And in my day-to-day -day life, it means I'm often late for things because I won't end an interaction until that interaction's over, right? Like I don't like cutting things short unless I have to. Um, and that kind of bleeds into finding balance in my creative practice because it can be really hard when I'm prioritizing my family or my friends or you know all of the other things I have to do. Um, it can be hard to really carve out the time that I need to actually do the work because in reality, like time is our most um, finite resource that we have. Uh, it's we can't get it back, and it's really hard to budget for it. Um, so something I've been working on in therapy has been to uh, really schedule all of that out, to really block out, anticipate the amount of time something, a task is going to take, even things that have nothing to do with work um, because all of those things are going to cost me something, um, which you know has also helped me to develop a little bit more time anxiety than I had ever had <laughs> before. But you know, the, still seeing the therapist will work on that part of it. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, like list making um, and and scheduling were both very important things for are both very important things for me. Um, it it can be really challenging. I don't know. People talk about like different brain structures for creative people and how some people maybe don't start a business because <laughs> your brain isn't structured for the business minded side of things. Um, and I've been training myself for maybe the past five or six years to be able to run my business, to be able to make quarterly uh, tax payments and to, you know, track my finances and all of those things. Um, and all of those also get in the way of the creative practice, you know? So one thing I would say to people who are looking to uh, uh, monetize their creative practices is like really take stock of how much do you want to be a business owner versus do you want to sort of follow the career progression just like you know we did in the hospitality industry of finding some way that somebody else can manage the rest of that for you right like is it possible to join an agency to find people who are interested or who have experience with that that you can sort of talk to and find mentorship in that way because maybe you don't want to spend, you know, all of January pulling your hair out. Um, or maybe you're more organized than I am. It <laughs> could be either way. Um, yeah, I got very distracted by that tangent, but that's a big reason why uh, having the to-do list and having a Google calendar really keeps me on focus so that I don't end up losing all my time to, you know, getting really wrapped up in a discussion or a text or, you know, another project that I've taken on because of responsibility. Oh, wait, can I take a little bit more time? Yeah. The other thing that's really important to me is learning when to say no to things too, because, uh, you know, just like what Rich was saying about, you know, finding that balance of what is financially uh, sustainable for you versus, you know, what might be more expensive exploitative. I never say that word out loud, but you know, you don't want to be exploited, especially as an artist. It's very vague, right? What everything is valued at. Um, so one thing is really recognizing those opportunities where you can say no and reclaim back your own time because your time is incredibly valuable. Um, oh my gosh. And I lost the other thing. Maybe it'll come back to me learning to say no. And the other thing's gone. I'll tell you guys later. <laughs> well, we had a great question from Daniel while it uh, bubbles uh, through you. Um, the question was, what um, other artists inspire you in your work? Oh. I can start, Daisy, if you'd like. I, I don't mind going first. Um, there's a lot of people who I find very inspiring. Um, my biggest uh, mentor when I was younger uh, is an illustrator, Jeffrey Fisher. He set up this incredible studio where we would figure draw every Sunday and we'd do like an illustration picture making class. And uh, he was very much like us, you know, he um, or at least I relate. He dropped out of Parsons and then kind of just like did his own thing. He kept going. He stopped paying, but he made friends with the teachers. That was the other thing I was going to say, human connection, very important. But um, yeah, like really it's that networking. It's the thing that we do like 
in, you know, our, our hospitality jobs, like that is the stuff that's really going to get you work as a creative person too, uh, or those connections that are going to open other doors and opportunities. So Jeff continued going to Parsons, despite him not going to Parsons, he was still seeing all of his professors. Um, and he really just like, taught me this kind of work ethic, which is like really valuing art for uh, the, you know, the mastery of a skill, but also the, uh, the sort of spiritual fulfillment, right? Learning how to treat art as a playground so that you can discover yourself a little bit more clearly. Um, and so I really, really love and appreciate Jeff to the end of the world for like everything he taught me um, and for like really instilling that kind of attitude into me of like, oh, you messed that thing up. Well, you can always do it again because you've proved to yourself that you've done it once, you know, and like, don't be precious about things and like just attack the page, right? Like teaching me different kinds of uh, exercises that even when I felt really blocked, it was like, oh, sometimes when you set yourself limitations, that's what's going to make you more creative. Um, so him and the entire community he created uh, is incredibly inspiring to me. And then I'm really inspired by a lot of my colleagues now. I started streaming on Twitch and kind of became embedded in this artist community. And uh yeah, it's it's crazy because it's made me realize that like with this whole social media thing, we can suddenly become like weird little celebrities overnight when we were never really prepared for it. Um, and then that sort of like, is it high school? That mentality of like kind of being intimidated by other people because it's like, oh my God, like maybe they're better. Or maybe they're, they won't like me, blah, blah, blah. Our whole imposter syndrome thing. Um, it it, it made me realize like all of us are sort of just like shy antisocial people who are hiding on the internet uh, because that's how we grew up because we were really shy. Um, and we've sort of like all come together in this really wonderful community of people who are feeding into that and sharing ideas. We started an accountability group online where we like helped each other open our online stores. And yeah, I. It's, it's a list too long to name of the artists that inspire me. But uh, if you're ever looking for artists to watch their processes, go hang out on Twitch. Although they had a big hack recently. So change your passwords, I guess. Anyway, Rich, tell me about the artists that inspire you. Yeah, you know, actually that was a good transition when you're talking about shyness, because I think I joined this industry based on being really shy. And um, it was like, Maybe the first like jump, like, let me just, just jump off and figure it out. Um, I would say for artists that really inspire me, I think primarily it has always been music for me, musicians across the board, um, whether, you know, artists that we all know that are you know, just on the, you know, they're important and popular on the radio and whatnot, but even just like local artists and musicians, you know, I tune in to local like, um, radio station in Chicago um, that just primarily plays like um, South Side Chicago hip hop as well as um, like creative um, alternative, um, but primarily like just smaller artists. And so that's always been the kind of thing for me. And even just like going back into like nostalgic music that I used to listen to across the board, um, as many people are that are just multifaceted with music. My music platform is everywhere, literally at any point in time. And I'm very like scene specific when it comes to music, um, where like something needs to be playing and a specific thing that I wanna do and it's kind of curated to that, but that's a different uh, mnemonic device we can talk about. Um, but I think in more recently, which is a new inspiration, I think during the pandemic was um, curation of design and um, like, for example, like antique and, and modern vintage, and as well as both on fashion and in furniture. So um, this most recent passion that I have is that, you know, anytime I travel with my partner anywhere, I see, you know, the oldest antique store, I get to talk with the person who's curated it. And it's, it is an artist curating something, whether they're jam packing a thousand things in this one spot, but each little corner looks the way it does kind of for a reason. And it may be because of chaos, but it also is something to see. And there's so much stimulus there that you can be literally, I have to like have a 
a beverage afterwards because it's just so much to inhold like at one time, but it is so much history or so much of some someone's or multi people's thing in one little space. And I love it. I want to find a way in which I can um, create it or I can create it with others or make it a platform for other people to enjoy to some degree. But that's my most recent artist inspiration would be the creation of antique and modern furniture and fashion. Very exciting, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing uh, you share that because uh, I definitely love modern furniture, and I'm so inspired by it in so many different ways. Please share. Oh my God, George um, Nakashima. Uh, we have another question for you all for the chat, and we really want to know, um, based on knowing your why and trying to figure out, we have had the discussion about trying to figure out what your voice is and what it is that. Um, you have to uniquely say in um, either the industry or in in the world because your uh, perspective is so unique for all people. This is for the chat. Um, what do you want to talk about or like to talk about the most right now? Um, and have that as a consideration while we're uh, talking about next, what are you doing now? Uh, do you want to take that on, Rich? What are uh, you excited about right now uh, that you are working on in your art and then uh, follow up with in your post? Of course. Yeah, I, you know, I'm actually just right now trying to re, uh, like relive some of some old photos. So what I've tried to do is, you know, when you're, a, and I think maybe artists can definitely relate to this, when you draw like your first picture or you kind of work on your first curations of art, and then you like go and do tons of projects and then maybe go back to it. You kind of look and you're a little, not embarrassed, but you're just like, oh, I could have done better. I could have done all this stuff. And so I'm trying to maybe rework some of the stuff that I did with not as much knowledge as I have now. Um, so it's specifically what that is, is uh, taking a little more away from the food and beverage photography and videography and, and curating like scenic, um, perspective and and rather than just taking a picture of a scene but like looking at something and being able to like see you know and, and reading as well of just uh you know just looking through tons of photos and reading reading th navigating through a lot of photography history so something that i've been trying to like continue to work on um, but yeah that's something that i'm really trying to do is kind of push my envelope of some stuff that i used to take photos of of things that would just like bring out a camera and just shoot and then maybe curate of like why i did that um, so that's one thing that I'm doing to kind of um, continue to relive it. Um, but I think that what I've been really, really trying to do in that same space is be better at not only taking the photo or recording the video, but purposefully doing it um, not for a paid project. Um, and so I think that you know, again, with the pandemic, there was a lot of um, uh, inquiries, which thank you all, whoever is out there to help me through that, and including Zara and, and, and Rob and Nance from Beam. So they've been very helpful in that. But now being like, or I'm not taking a video or a photo of a, a drink or a beverage or an event or a person, go. And finding a little more of a struggle, but also love it in that like struggle, inspiration, struggle, inspiration in that and trying to just push myself to be able to be, to learn a little more on that realms of things. Because of course I'm inspired by those who take just a really great photo, but I, I sometimes I'm like, how, how did you see that? Or how did, how did mm -hmm. that happen? You know, there was a second part to this question and I feel like I lost it. <laughs> um we were talking about what you are doing uh, now. Um, yeah. And I think that that was uh, the, the clear ask and, and you definitely okay. went, went into it and yeah. uh, what, what you are excited about. Um, so um, the, the excitement, I definitely see you're almost like having conversations with your past self. With yeah, your, exactly. Like really cool. <laughs> Daisy, uh, I would like to pose that same question to you. Um, what are you doing now and what is uh, keeping you excited now? Yeah, so my professional work of this year has actually kept me very excited. Um, I told myself at the end of last year that I wasn't going to say to yes to projects unless they were, well, I should rewind back and say I 
uh, when the pandemic started, I went back to school um, initially for business. And then I was like, you know, I dropped out of art school. I have all these credits, like I'm going to transfer and learn more about the materials I'm really interested in so that I can do my job better um, because I do a lot of sort of illustration, but also like product manufacturing and creation. So I really want to learn a lot more about um, the different kinds of materials that I can work with and sort of turn my art into. Um, and so because of this new course load, uh, I've had to say no to a lot of projects that didn't quite fall in line with my why. Um, and one of my biggest motivations for, or one of my biggest sort of pathways that I'm pursuing in my art is designing enamel pins. So I was like, I'm not gonna say yes to a project unless it's enamel pins or animation. That was literally like what I told myself. I was like, I will not say no to like my old clients to follow up on work. So I'm uh, doing actually a really fun project with uh, Adrian Hurtado, who's also a cap. Um, he started a business called Taco Guy. It's a taco truck that serves amazing, delicious tacos. Uh, and I designed the wrap for his truck and then all of his branding or a lot of his branding. Um, and so, you know, we've been working on things this year. I'm really excited. We're going to be making a new truck uh, as well. And then, um, yeah, I've been making a lot of enamel pin designs, which I've been pumped about. I've gotten to work with rainbow uh, metal for the first time and like really figured out what I'm going to get way too nerdy and technical about that. Anyway, I made like a rainbow skull pin with with glowing mushrooms. And it was like my first foray into this kind of design. Um, I did a couple pins for Sipsmith earlier this year as well. Uh, there was also um, a collaboration with the same author I did the skull pin for. We did a set of pins that have actual like embroidery thread threaded through them. And so it's really been a year of getting to explore like what are the limitations of the medium that I have currently and how can I push that further? You know, I haven't really seen any pins that have thread incorporated into them or that are sort of like multi Media. media thank you that's the <laughs> word <laughs> that are multimedia so um i've been really really enthusiastic about that um actually nick at mover and shaker has really helped me to uh sort of facilitate some of those more complicated projects which has been really cool um and yeah i feel really pumped about that and then i've been doing animation um i run like a run is a loose word it, as any D and D campaign, it's you know the way that they're run. But we uh, once a month, some friends and I get together and do like a charity D and D stream. And so I've been sort of learning how to like animate our little characters, so we have more of a TV show going on, and <laughs> has been really inspiring because it's just like you know on the internet right now, like VTubing is becoming more of a thing, and kind of getting to explore my like character design and animation has made me really nerd out and feel really excited about sequential art. Uh, and then I have one more thing. Sorry, guys. I'm really enthusiastic about art right now. Before you go, can you say what VTubing is? Oh, VTubing. It's hard to explain because I don't quite understand, but it seems to be when people use like a character, sometimes it's animated or sometimes it's very simple and kind of still as a representation of them, which I think is brilliant because we need to sort of protect our identities in this scarier time of the internet where it's really easy to like internet stalk and dox people. So, um, you know, having sort of something that isn't your face, but is still engaging with your audience mm -hmm. is really interesting interesting um and there are even like vtubers that are purely ai like the whole thing it gets really spooky if you guys ever want to like talk about it you can contact me on whatever social media you can find me on and be like i want to nerd about out about any of the things you said and i'll be like yeah absolutely we'll talk for like hours about any of this stuff <laughs> um but i uh yes the vtubing thing it's fascinating um yeah, my friend actually did like a full face rig where it reads your face from like the input from a face camera, right? And then maps it to like 
uh, the illustrated sort of elements that he's created for his character. So his character will move the way his face moves and will talk the way his face talks and will blink when he blinks. And it's crazy. Like you can get really advanced. I am not there. I'm like, I will make two frames of animation. And when you talk, the mouse will open and it'll sort of look like they're talking for you. <laughs> but, and then the thing that I've actually, the thing that's been truly feeding my soul in a way that is like meditative and restorative is I recently took up ceramics within the past year and a half. Um, and that has been like by far my favorite thing that I've done since the pandemic started was like actually taking a formal class uh, getting to, you know, know, uh, having a studio space with fellow artists again, and getting to sort of really collaborate and talk to each other about what we're doing and what we're learning about and what we're trying to achieve and like brainstorming and speculating how to achieve that, what kind of glazes will work with it. Like I, that really feeds me that sort of engagement in the arts community. And I love that kind of collaboration. So, um, yeah, it's just been, it's been a really great way to pursue my uh, artistic education again in a, in, in a way that I, uh, that really, yeah, feeds me. <laughs> I lost track of the sentence, but it's, yeah, guys, take a ceramics class. It's like mm -hmm. totally worth it because it's so physical and like, you know, especially with the wheel, like it's just you zone out and you kind of have to really focus and be present in the moment. It's this physical meditation and I love it. We appreciate uh, your passion for ceramics too, Brie. That was awesome. <laughs> um, and um, we had been talking a little bit and we touched on it a little bit um, when um, we were talking about finding your why and it changing around you, but um, I would really like to know what you've pivoted into or out of during these past two years where things have just kind of changed around us. Oh, should I start? Yes. Okay. Right. So um, as I said, I just started going back to school. Um, so that is what I would say I really strongly pivoted into. Um, I, you know, was focusing mainly on my business um, and, and connecting with my family and those things were very fulfilling, but I was finding myself very overwhelmed by the business side of things. So I decided like, it's the pandemic, like all the classes are online. It'll be really convenient to do this. I'm just going to take a bunch of business classes and see if the formal training will help me handle my own stuff better. Um, and it, it has. I was going to be a business administration major and then realized that that is incredibly corporate and not suitable for the way that I operate in the slightest. Um, so I changed my major because of that. But um, that pivot into education came with uh, some really great upsides of like building my confidence again into, you know, oh yeah, like I can function in a setting with a bunch of people after working from home by myself, very isolated for about three years and loving that. <laughs> like now, now interacting with people on a regular basis uh, has definitely been really beneficial. Connecting with people like that, again, has been really beneficial. Um, but it has also really made me face uh, some of my more perfectionist tendencies, um, which has been a bit of a struggle. My anxiety has definitely jumped up maybe because of, you know, our global pandemic too, but um, a big thing has just been like school and sort of the, the structured responsibilities that come with school that don't always necessarily feel like they are necessary, you know, um, but yeah. Did I answer the question as far as pivoting? Pivoting into, and then you yeah. pivoted into school, but you pivoted out of certain parts of it. And then you pivoted back into the parts that worked for you. I do a lot of pivoting. But, okay. <laughs> How about you, Rich? Uh, yeah, what I've, what I've definitely pivoted out of was um, saying, I mean, I think Daisy definitely touched on this earlier, is saying yes to everything. Uh, I don't want to say yes to everything because, you know, it's it, my, my life is different. Um, like the last two years, uh, 
prior to that, I was just saying yes to absolutely everything and every project and every shift and every event and just overworking myself. And now I don't want to do that. And, um, and I know that's, uh, it's not, it's not, it's, I wasn't, I'm not doing it simply because I don't have the time for it, but I'm doing it going back to prioritizing just some things that are more important. So what I'm pivoting more into um, is this kind of the same things, you know, taking the time to really be present with my friends and be present with people I haven't talked to or seen to in a while, whether it's virtual or not, and um, taking some more time to travel that's not on a work agenda or, and um, you know, not you know, batching 6,000 cocktails. I love to have a cocktail. I love it. I miss it so much. Um, but it's nice to go like, go to a place and not feel like I'm here for work or here for uh, 6 a.m. call time, something like that. And uh, uh, I do miss those things too. And I think that there will be a, a resurgence of that. And I can't wait to go back to that and maybe see it from the sideline to some degree. But uh, I'm, you know, I would say that one other thing I'm pivoting more into as well is perhaps the thought of, um, you know, there was a long time where I was thinking that opening your own concept in the hospitality industry was almost impossible. And, um, and I'm not saying it took a pandemic for it to become possible because that's, I don't want to say that, that taking that as a, analyzing that as a, a good thing because it's not at all. Um, there's a lot of terrible and, and, ups, and you know disappointing and upsetting things that happened during that. Um, but I do think that with that low, a lot of people have come back into the industry who really do truly love it and want to bring it to the higher highs and want to just continue to create and, and, and make, make sense of not working for a conglomerate or whatnot and working for themselves. So I do want to maybe revisit that idea to some degree. And I think that finding the right people um, to get there. And I have some lovely people I've been working with recently that I know that that will be the transition to something like that. But, uh, you know, we all, maybe we've all been there, whether you, you've been with the cohorts or cohorts for a long time, whether our bar team or, um, you know, fellow ambassadors on the advocacy side, and you're like, we want to do something together. Because uh, you're just so like-minded, you're just working side by side with each other. And then you know, life just happens. And not that that can't still happen, but, you know, mm -hmm. the next step of your journey is starting and the st that step has maybe gone by the wayside. And, um, so I think that's something I'm maybe pivoting back into is that the possibility of actually owning a concept with pe like-minded people could still happen. That is fascinating because my next question was, what does the future hold for you? And I feel <laughs> like you were just like delving into that. Um, but I would also like to know a little bit more about what the future holds for you as an artist, not just uh, within hospitality. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, for an artist specifically, I, I really, really want to um, continue to curate photos and perhaps video, but primarily photos at the moment of things that I'm not uncomfortable with, but things that I just don't know and I'm unseen. And, and I shoot through a lens a specific way every time almost. And I'm trying to change that a little bit and look, not change it because I think that how I did it before is wrong. I'm still going to use adaptations of, of how I look through a lens um, for my future work. But I, I, I do truly want to explore, not even, all, even on the technology side of the photography of working with different cameras, working for different lenses, looking at field of view, uh, just really analyzing more than just shooting a photo. I, I just want to delve into it further and whether that's something I want to do and I want to keep it kind of that way for you know forever I don't know if I again I don't want to make it my primary f focus of of my uh, professional career but um, yeah I think that's something I want to continue to do artists I'd love to can you know I, I play still music here and there and I would love for more time of that I think that's something that I you can't have enough of, of being able to do something you used to do so much that you loved but now have more time for specifically you know just picking up the guitar more, picking up the violin more. I'd love to do that more. So that's something I'm going to put in priority, speaking of. Um, and then the rest of, you know, the future is also just to make more lists and, uh, you know, and more priorities. And, uh, you know, hopefully we get to some degree out of and learning more of just how this pandemic will navigate our lives moving forward and figure out how we can always continue to be safe and smart and also be able to enjoy and, and, and love and experience the rest. So um, I would say that 
I definitely just want to see a lot of you all and, and see more faces and see more places I haven't been and um, yeah, just travel as much as I can so I can maybe again, like one, once I know that concretely a, a future business is maybe in an arm's reach, I know that I'm going to just dive right in. And so, um, yeah, exciting, all exciting stuff. <laughs> How about you, Daisy? Um, so the future I see from my personal work is to um, continue finding the things that really inspire me to create uh, artwork for myself and then put that out more into the world. So I kind of want to lean more towards, I don't want to say fine arts because there's a whole attitude with that that I don't particularly love. But I do want to do things that are more self-motivated and less client driven, although uh, I don't want to give up the client stuff because people pleasing is part of the reason that I became a bartender and then became an illustrator. Um, but I, uh, I also think that what I see in the future um, a lot of, because of the pandemic um, is is more collaboration and more transparency, um, especially in my own life. I really want that. I really want to connect with other artists and really like push them, act as a mentor to make sure that, you know, they at least have the information that I know so they don't have to do all the work that I did to get to my point, right? Like we all are always building up, um, our knowledge base and being able to pass that forward and share that with other people so we can continue to progress versus like constantly all just trying to like survive. Um, that sort of thought has been tumbling around in my head for a long time. And so, you know, accountability groups and things like that have been really important to me, um, being able to encourage my fellow artists uh, and, you know, <sighs> I'll be honest, like those spaces right now, even online to do that are limited, right? Because they are usually owned by a bigger corporation that has their interests at heart and not community at heart, right? But we can still use these ways of being able to connect with each other to sort of build each other up. And so that's something that has been um, really significant for me currently, but also in the future, I see that uh, continuing forward as something that I really wanna focus on um, you know, and it's not just art artistic communities or creative communities, it's also uh, marginalized communities, right? Like that's a thing that we're really becoming aware of um, because of just how much the pandemic has pointed out uh, inequities in our society. So I feel very uh, uh, informed by those things to uh, decide on future work, yeah. I love that. That's so exciting. I would love to hear more from both of you, um, especially on these uh, as these future things unfold in your world. <laughs> Obviously, you know, I follow you both on the IGs and stuff, but um, I would love to like, you know, see you, Rich, you know, doing some sort of virtual concert that I can listen to and you, Daisy, uh, I'm definitely going to follow you on Twitch because I want to see your process more because I usually just like get to see some of the bits that are on the IGs but um, I definitely want to see some of more in-depth of your uh, process. Thank you both Love so sure. much. Um, I know that Alex has another poll that came out for you about whether or not you're capped, and I do believe that she has a final question for you. But while uh, that is coming up, we would love to hear more from you, and uh, I would like to open it up so you all can ask questions for Rich and Daisy. I think I see one question up there already, which is from Bree saying, uh, what are some of your ways to re-inspire yourself when you've been feeling unproductive and your curiosity is lacking? Which is such an excellent question. <laughs> uh, I'll, yeah, I'll take it a little bit. Do something you haven't ever done or do something you wanted to always do but never did it because there was something stopping you to do so. I mean, you gotta think that, and I don't wanna be like broader image of that. You gotta do everything to figure out what your thing is. That's not, don't, I'm not trying to force you to do something you don't wanna do, but um, 
I think trying to mix it up is something that I would like to say, because of course we get stuck in a uh, schedule and we get stuck in um, an everyday thing. And that's also okay to be consistent. That's kind of sometimes what we strive for is consistency in our livelihood, especially when there's an inconsistent amount of time sometimes with the pandemic. So I can, I definitely understand consistency, but um, challenging yourself into doing something that you maybe you've always wanted to do or something that you were just really, really love from afar and, and try it, you know? I, I think for personally for me, something that I really tried and I know it's so simple, but I was so frustrated by having to like jump rope. I know that's like an act that I was like, I can never get it. You know, as a musician, it's like a rhythm, right? You'd be able to get it. It's like, no, it's so much harder. Um, so I forced myself to learn during the pandemic. And whoever watched all my Instagram stories of me jumping in my garage, I applaud you because it was, uh, it was a, I could see how it was a little much, but uh, I know that's, that's something simple, but um, yeah, I don't know. I would just say, just do something that you want to, you've never tried that you were like, I, I think I could try this, do it. It'll inspire you, I promise. And that whole like posting the video on IG, that accountability is like, a really great way to start a task and stick to it. I did a similar thing during the pandemic where I started playing like Ring Fit on my stream because I was like, oh no, everyone is is locked in their houses and we need to like keep our sort of immune systems up, right? So I was just like, look, I really hate exercising, but if you want to join me for like 15 minutes to an hour of exercise, like let's do some squats for a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I think about artist block a lot, um, especially because it took a really long time for me to find a, a personal purpose that wasn't motivated by other people and doing that is really vulnerable it's so hard to like constantly ask yourself to like pull that kind of thing out of you and then express it right like I have trouble just expressing myself in writing when I have like something I have to write for work or an assignment I'm like oh my god taking the ball of thoughts and anxieties and whatever else and just stringing together a sentence that's coherent by the end of it feels like this impossible task. Uh, I just got totally distracted by that. This isn't therapy. Um, but I, I think a lot about um, just how we can direct our creative practices in a way that feels sustainable. And I really like to put limitations uh, on myself when I feel that way so that I can't possibly get carried away with all of the choices. Um, so some, Brie, I know you said you're really interested in ceramics um, and I obviously focus a lot more on the visual art category of it, but I think it can be sort of remixed for other kinds of creative fields is like set yourself time limits. Tell yourself you're gonna do a daily practice, but it's gonna be five minutes a day or 15 minutes a day. Um, and then when you do those things like prompt lists can be really great because then you don't have to be synthesizing all the information. You can kind of plant a seed and see what grows from it. Um, and, and sometimes having like a really severe limitation on it so that you are focusing on um, accomplishing the task versus the product at the end uh, can be really helpful. So I often tell my students if they're like struggling with drawing a figure or figuring out what they wanna do is to like draw with their non-dominant hand because it rewires the way that you are using your brain to draw. Um, if you're using your dominant hand, I, I'm right-handed, so obviously this is why I'm talking with my hands right now. But when you draw with your dominant hand in this visual uh, art context, uh, you are you have a very strong relationship with that hand. So you are assuming a lot of the motions because you know that that's what's going to happen. And your hand has a lot of muscle memory. So it already kind of knows how to draw an eye, how to draw a nose in the way that it does it, right? But when you switch to your non-dominant hand, you switch from your assumption of something to a much more um, like hand-eye uh, relationship. And so you're thinking a lot more about what you're actually looking at and how 
just to even accomplish the task of drawing it and you won't do it well, right? So the expectation isn't to do it at a hundred percent level, right? It's, it's to really develop your relationship with being able to see versus your ability to draw. Um, and so, you know, like that's a practice that I really like. I also like doing blind contour where you're not allowed to look at it at all. Again, the goal isn't to make something beautiful. It's to really learn how to observe and develop that more intimate relationship with whatever you're trying to draw, right? Um, and then, uh, yeah, time limits. The other thing is like, sometimes you start making something, you're pouring your heart and soul into it, and then it you hate it, uh, you mess up somehow, and it's just terrible, right? And uh, in those moments, Sometimes it's great to recognize like, ah, let's time, it's, let's give up on that, right? Um, but sometimes you can change your goal, pivot, right? Instead of it being, I'm trying to make a perfect piece, it's how can I have fun with this and just mess it up on purpose? Like, how can I just, how many ways can I make this go wrong and then see what that result is, right? Because you're changing it from this high pressure sort of expectation for your art to a playground and giving yourself that opportunity to play, which like, I always try to push for anybody who's pursuing creativity is like, yes, accomplishment, great. Mastery, great. Financial uh, compensation, great. If you can survive on it, wonderful. But to me, like the true purpose of art is self-expression and the ability to be able to just play and figure yourself out in the process. And so like, approaching everything with that playground mentality can really help you to open up your creativity. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> um, Daniel Jang said in the chats that um, he was terrified to actually go out of his room when he was like DJing at home. And part of that is like, I think was, it was such a great point is really about, you know, sometimes you just have to walk into the fear. Like, and because even if you're terrible at it, it doesn't matter. You did it. And then you can do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing you know, you become good at something. And that and that's what it is, is like, that's, as Daisy was saying, as Rich was saying earlier, um, and I also had the same experience. Um, I was an extremely shy person. And I walked into the fear of, to get out of the shyness by working in the hospitality industry. It is the thing that made me feel like the world wasn't going to pass me by and I would have never experienced life. Um, and so like facing the fear sometimes is the way to go. Yeah, and I'll, I'll put one little note to kind of send it off from for me is too, is that you know, I think Seth mentioned in the chat is that you don't have to do it alone. And the thing is, is there's so many resources out there, but not even on the professional help of it. Um, do things with others. I mean, we live on a planet to do so to you know and I understand there's sometimes safety restrictions and and you know the even restriction of your own self of being a little just scared and, and in general I, I completely understand that there's also other platforms to that that maybe make sense for you to be able to share your creativity with others or do things that you haven't done with others but uh, you know I, I think just we lived so for a while, we realized, you know, after like a little over a year and a half of how dependent human interaction is with others. And I know Daisy really wanted to touch on it um, for a little bit, but it's so vital. It is like the one thing that I know keeps my heart beating is the, the just people that are just being around others and in any platform that may be. And so, knowing that you're just not alone in whatever you want to do, or you're not the same, you're not alone in the feeling that you're feeling that, you know, there's someone out there that can get you off um, to be, continue to be motivated and, and get you off that like rut of that you're in that you feel like you maybe you're just stuck. Um, and it may take a little time, but you know, you're not completely alone. So. I just want to add like a lot of us creatives are really shy. I remember in like, every cocktail conference that I've ever been to. Um, <laughs> I'm incredibly shy, but I, 
I project my anxiety, my social anxiety onto other people. So I like aggressively try to be welcoming to other people. And I'm like, hi, I'm Daisy. What's your name? If you could like squirt condiments out of your fingers, <laughs> what would they be? Like, <laughs> you know, I'm disarmingly awkward because I'm just incredibly awkward. But like, I found that, you know, I was really able to connect with Rich and with Zara because of these kinds of events, right? Because of this human connection. And because we recognize that sort of creative, socially anxious, like, do we really want to be here? We love people, but also do we really want to be here kind of feeling. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's something that we can really use to drive each other. Like I, I did that to my mom, by the way, I made her take the ceramics class too. And now she's addicted as well. <laughs> and it was an opportunity to like reconnect with my mom in a way that okay. I normally don't have that context for. That's fantastic. Um, we have a really fascinating question um, in the Q&A and it is from an anonymous sender. Um, they, who started bartending in 2019 and did so for four months into the pandemic, but moved to another city, started interviewing at local bars and chose a job outside of the industry that pays more, stills miss bartending, um, keeping the love for it alive by starting a blog about the experience, is the question being, are they still part of the industry through the blogging? Yes. I... Mm -hmm. I will actively, actively like advocate for you right now because I feel that uh, I feel that imposter syndrome on a regular basis. I, you know, was really, really hard into my bartending career for a long time. I was working all these cocktail events. I mean, certainly not as long as my compatriots here, uh, but I was working a lot of events. I was really passionate and really trying to find like a, a job that was sustainable for me when I moved to a new city. And it was not possible. Like the way that maybe it was the way I approached it. Maybe it was the mood of the city. I don't know, but it didn't click. And I couldn't really, it, it, it damaged my feeling of how I could exist in the service industry because I poured my heart and my effort into it. And it taught me that like my job stability was non-existent, right? Like I relied on tips. And then if somebody who was above me didn't like me, I would just be fired and I'd have to start somewhere else. And obviously I still carry a little bit of that anxiety with me, but I, I felt incredibly like an imposter because Zara would be like, come on, let's go to Tales together. <laughs> And I'd be like, I don't know how to introduce myself in places because I'm not a bartender anymore because my goal was never to open a bar like Rich that was, you know, my own concept because that wasn't my why and I didn't have one, you know, my favorite things were like connecting with people and mastering technique because I really, I, yeah, I love that kind of stuff, but you're absolutely still a part of the industry. You're still bringing, you know, your perspective to it. Uh, and it's often that we tell ourselves that we aren't, right? It's not usually that other people are like, oh, you're not a part of our clique anymore, right? Like, all, it's almost never that. And when it is, that's their problem, right? That's not, that's not even our kind of issue, right? Because that's somebody else being judgmental for truly no reason that's hella petty right but we shouldn't have to be petty like that with ourselves yeah rich what, what are your thoughts no i mean i i i literally said some of the same stuff i was going to align with that i think that you know there's even times in which i have definitely done the imposter syndrome many in times in, in that same regards and uh no i you're still in it i think yeah um being an advocate of the industry means that you're in the industry. <laughs> yes, wholeheartedly. Yeah. I think if you have that passion, if it's a part of your why, then mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what position you're in in the industry, you are still, you know, very much a part of it. Jo Joanne made such a wonderful point. She says, I have a handyman, a plumber. They understand our service world. They found their niche and I would consider those types part of my industry too. Oh, absolutely. Amazing. So, so many people make our industry work. 
I just wanted, I wanted to say one other thing, because we were talking about, you know, our why and how we got to that journey. And it made me think of this song that um, is uh, by this artist. Her name is Amber Rubarth, and the song is called Negative Space, I believe. And this woman uh, is now like a singer songwriter. I think she does it for TV, but she took many stages to her journey um, and was a chainsaw artist at one point. Wow. And so the song is about like uh, discovering what shape you are based on everything that gets carved away from you, right? It's that whole like reduction sculpture carving um, idea. And just like, that is uh, at least something I really resonate with when it comes to finding out your purpose, right? Or like, you know, people who feel inclined with like, love and romance and things like that too it's like sometimes you find the journey of like who the right person is for you by figuring out all the ways other people were not right for you right and like same thing with your purpose it's like sometimes it's like oh yeah this thing makes me feel really good I pursue that sometimes it's like there's so many things that make me feel not good like how do I avoid those things and come to what feels more like alignment any final thoughts from you, Rich? Um, yeah, I think that, again, you know, some, some, some big things that I wanted to address that I maybe realized even just having a discussion with Daisy and Zara again today was that um, you have to really, outside of even the mental health of, of things, and we can talk about that for a long period of time, you have to really give yourself a little bit of a break and knowing that um, things are hard and life sometimes just gives you crazy swings and things that are out of your control. And um, I know this is a very cliche answer, but it's like one thing at a time kind of thing. And uh, I've really taken that time to do that. And um, whether it affects other things, it's just kind of how the natural wavelength of life works and um, giving yourself more time in general, whatever that means. So blocking out a time in which you know, Zara and I mentioned a few weeks ago about, I, I get off work and I, sell, I tell my cohorts at work, I'm like, I can't wait to go home and stare at a wall. And they're like, what do you mean? It's like, you know, it's everything and especially in our artistries or our hospitality life is so much stimulus and so many things of rapid fire hitting your like neurons and your brain at all, at all times that it is so nice for it to be really quiet and stare at a wall. And I think that prior to, you know, we had talked about us being shy and, you know, there's, there's still degrees of us being a little anxious and shy to, to a certain degree and specifically myself. It's like a moment of, um, in which you can kind of re go back to like being in that position of not vulnerability, but maybe so of being like, ah, I, I'm, I'm here just, you know, about kind of alone but by myself and I enjoy it now you know I think there was times prior where that wasn't the case and, and uh, it's nice to just kind of clock out your brain but still be present <laughs> to a certain degree and whatever what you do in that time is fine but you know making time for that is vitally important staring at a wall highly encourage it <laughs> I agree stare at a wall <laughs> Thank you both so much. Thank you, Tales of the Cocktail Foundation, for having us. And thank you, our wonderful audience, for your extraordinary questions. We've had such a wonderful time uh, having these uh, conversations. And uh, we hope that you got something out of it and that you are uh, taking the time to find your why as you progress through your journey. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Please reach out. Thank yes, you. Please.